Welcome to Redefining Medicine, an intimate and personalized program that illustrates a different side of the practice of medicine. Our in-depth conversations will focus on the physicians and practitioners who are redefining medicine through their integrative, functional, and holistic approach to health and well-being. We are excited to welcome Dr. Elisa Song, an integrative pediatrician and medical director based in California. Welcome. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here. So let's get started by, uh, if you would please tell us a little bit about your background. Where did you go to med school and where did you first start practicing? Yeah, so I grew up in New Jersey mm -hmm. um, and I came out here to California to Stanford for my undergraduate and at that point I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I had actually thought, I knew I wanted to work with kids. Uh, I had thought about being a um, children's advocate, public policy, political advocate uh, with the Children's Defense Fund in DC. Thought about being a teacher, wasn't quite sure. Um, finally, I decided my senior year, I think I'm going to be a pediatrician. <laughs> so I started down that route, but it was really interesting because as I was deciding, looking into medical school, I actually was really interested in best year. Now this is back in, um, I'm going to date myself, it was back in 1990 uh, when I was looking at naturopathic colleges as well. My mother, who was an OBGYN, um, completely dissuaded me, was like, I don't know what an ND is, um, maybe become a real doctor first. <laughs> but I was actually, the reason I was really inspired to look into more naturopathic integrative medicine was because it was that year when I was a senior that there was this conference I saw, a little flyer for on the billboard on one of the telephone posts, um, advertising for this conference of the American Holistic Medical Association, which doesn't exist anymore. Uh, but somehow, as a senior, I got myself down to Santa Clara Convention Center and heard Andrew Weil, Deepak Chopra, oh. Joan Borisenko, these people who were barely getting known and it just, it blew my mind. Yeah. So it, that was pivotal because when I went to medical school at NYU, very, very conservative medical school at the time, um, not a single integrative, natural, holistic approach. <laughs> and it kind of, it disheartened me. Um, so I went on to residency to see, well, would it be different if I actually were in pediatrics? And I did my residency at UCSF and it still was disheartening because we had all of these, these band-aids, right? Great for trauma, great for infections. We were able to cure cancers, but throughout those three years, I just saw kids getting sicker and sicker and sicker. And we weren't really, mm, there wasn't an end to medications. Right? If you have a child with an autoimmune illness and you put them on a heavy duty immunosuppressant when they're young, let's say when they're three or four or five, what's the end? And so when I came out of residency, it was so mind blowing. I was told when I finished residency in the year 2000 that if I saw a handful of kids with autism in my lifetime, that would be a lot. Right, fast forward five years into my private practice and I could barely breathe because my practice was flooded with kids and parents of kids with autism who knew that there was another way, knew that there was a way to really get kids better from the inside out. And so I, that was my mission, right? To learn functional medicine, uh, learn acupuncture, learn homeopathy, learn herbal medicine, learn about essential oils, really trying to figure out how do we incorporate the best that conventional medicine has to offer because there is a time and a place for that but that's not really healing, and then learn all these other modalities that could really hopefully help heal kids from the inside out. Right. So you spoke earlier this morning, uh, and what was the topic of your conversation? So I spoke on PANS and PANDAS. So PANS stands for Pediatric Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Syndrome, and PANDAS is actually a subset of PANS when it's triggered in particular by strep infections. And PANDAS stands for Pediatric Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Disorders Associated with Strep. This is something that I want every parent, every grandparent, every teacher, every doctor, every psychiatrist to know about because it is something that at some point in all of our lives we will know a child or probably many children who have underlying PANS and PANDAS as a reason for their neuropsychiatric symptoms. Those kids who have been diagnosed with OCD, ODD, ADHD, RAD, whatever plethora of initials that are being given now for kids who have you know, neuropsychiatric symptoms many of those kids will have underlying PANS, and PANS is an autoimmune encephalitis. 
right? An autoimmune brain inflammation that's often tr triggered by infections, sometimes by env uh, environmental toxins like molds, um, biotoxins, heavy metals. But this is something if we're not aware of, we're going to relegate these, these children then to a lifetime of psychiatric medicines that probably don't work that well and with no end in sight. So I sometimes will see kids who come to me who are already, you know, at 12 years of age on three psychiatric medications and, and they're not working. And the psychiatrist wants to put on a fourth. And finally, it's like, let's, let's pause and think what else could be going on when these medications aren't working. And so with the more natural approach through uh, uh, diet and, and perhaps uh, detox protocols and things like that. You know, give us an, an, an idea of, of how you approach a patient care today. Yeah, so that was actually a good part of my lecture today where I talk about a six-step functional and integrative medicine approach to really helping our kids with pans and pandas. Because just like any other autoimmune disease that you might see in a child or might see in an adult, it's not an easy quick fix. There's never a quick fix and unfortunately with pans and pandas it's a journey and it can be a long journey and you need to as a practitioner be ready to be in it for the long haul but the rewards can be tremendous. So the first step is really identifying what triggered or what combination of factors triggered this child's autoimmune encephalitis. And often it's looking for infections, letting history be your guide. Did that child, before they suddenly have these neuropsychiatric symptoms, have influenza, have strep, have hand, foot, and mouth, have rosella, so have a tick bite, you know, live in a water damaged building. So you're really trying to get from your history what could have been the trigger. And for clinicians, it's also really important to know that the diagnostic criteria right now only includes kids who have an abrupt sudden onset, literally overnight. They're having OCD, anxiety, aggression, tantrums, cognitive decline, um, you know, all sorts of neuropsychiatric symptoms. But I will say, and I want to tell practitioners that more often than not, what I see in my practice are those less obvious cases where there's been a change in symptoms, an increase in anxiety, an increase in sort of OCD sensory issues and neuropsychiatric and somatic symptoms like handwriting decline or urinary frequency that's not as sudden and abrupt um, as, as what we might see in the news or read about, but is there and it's a change. So when we, when we just look at sudden and abrupt, we're gonna miss too many kids. But that's the first step is identifying and treating with the appropriate antimicrobial. Right. right. Um, the second step is putting out the inflammation. These kids' brains are literally on fire. They literally have inflammatory cytokines and autoantibodies in their brain. And so we need to dampen the fire because we want to get the fire down as quickly as possible to not cause long-term damage. That's going to be with things like omega-3 essential fatty acids, with curcumin. Um, I do use NSAIDs, right? Ibuprofen or naproxen can be really important to bring the fire down. Occasionally even using steroids, a prednisone burst, three to five day course. We got to get the fire down. We can put in all of the immune supports that we want, but if, if there's a forest fire, you need to get the forest fire out and then you deal with the embers. Right? right? The third step is dealing with the embers. How do we then regulate, right, get that counter regulatory part of the immune system working so that we have immune modulation, balance, balance to the immune system so that this child's immune system who went haywire after what should have been a, a quote normal strep infection developed autoimmunity instead. So those are things like IVIG, if you have access to that, although it can be quite expensive, from a functional standpoint and what's more easily accessible are going to be things like low-dose naltrexone, specialized pro-resolving mediators. These can be game changers. CBD, um, Chinese skull cap. So we want to use all of our tools that we have from a functional standpoint because we can bring the fire down. We know how to do that. Steroids are like a magic, right? Steroids, I mean, they, they make everything better in terms of fire but they're not gonna keep the fire down. So we use our immune modulators. The fourth step is looking at all of the other functional medicine clinical imbalances that our practitioners are already doing. Looking at gut dysbiosis, looking at the leaky gut, looking at nutrient insufficiencies and deficiencies, really important. Um, you're not going to build a solid foundation if your children's nutrient status isn't optimized. In particular, zinc, magnesium, vitamin D, your omega-3 essential fatty acids. 
Um, looking at mitochondrial dysfunction is really important for our kids with pans and pandas and histamine. We had some amazing lectures here, Dr. Weinstock talking about histamine, um, mast cell activation syndrome, and that absolutely can be a factor for our kids with pans and pandas. So that's the fourth step. The fifth step, which is so key, is really reconnecting and rebalancing the body, mind, spirit, the gut brain connection. This is essential for healing and keeping kids well. So I can't emphasize enough, this is not supplements, right? This is with belly breathing. It's with meditation and mindfulness. And um, children are, are able to to do that? So, yeah, so, and I gave the um, participants in the lecture some really good, easy tools for kids to implement. Because a kid's not going to sit there, you know, in lotus position zen for, right. you know, half an hour. <laughs> Most adults, frankly, aren't going to do that, right? right? So there is an app, a children's meditation app. Um, it's called Stop, Breathe, Think. It's super fun. My kids love it. Um, there are these little missions with animated videos with different, you know, animals on there that they have, you know, different missions where you can calm down or just do your square breathing. Um, you can um, slow your brain and focus. And so they can do these missions and they're really fun, three to five minutes in length. And they're actually practicing mindfulness. Um, you can teach your kids to belly breathe and a lot of adults don't know how to do diaphragmatic breathing. So I teach parents and kids together. <clears throat> there are um, books by um, Dawn Hubner, H-U-E-B-N-E-R. She's a child psychologist who is amazing and has a whole series of self-help books teaching kids cognitive behavioral tools for themselves, for their worries, their OCDs, their temper tantrums, their negativity, and more. So there are really good tools that you can use. And then I also will use uh, more passive tools like electro-stim to really stimulate right. ear acupuncture points can be really, really profound and, and you can teach parents how to use those points. Mm -hmm. um, Shen Men, which is an ear point, mm -hmm. uh, and also point zero have actually been found to increase heart rate variability and really get get that reconnection with the vagus nerve and the you know body, mind, spirit connection. Mm -hmm. um, so that's an that's a relatively easy tool. Uh, so I do I you know I I try to pull out all the all the tricks that I can. So short meditations for kids that are fun, books for them to read, more passive ways like with ear stimulation, you know, and, and really vagus nerve stimulation that way. So that's the fifth step, and then the sixth step is really recognizing that not one modality has all the answers. Um, functional medicine offers a lot. You know, I believe a lot more than conventional medicine has for our patients with chronic illness. But there are so many other modalities that can bring tons of value and healing that if even if we don't practice, we want to enlist the support of our colleagues in our communities if we have that available. I just mentioned acupuncture. Mm -hmm. If you don't do acupuncture yourself, find an acupuncture you can work with and talk about and really collaborate on patients. Um, really looking at homeopathy. I do, I practice clinical homeopathy, and there are some really good evidence-based studies showing that homeopathy can work. I do look at um, um, some essential oils. I mentioned a study on Silexin, which is an essential oil capsule with lavender essential oil, found to work better than escitalopram for reducing anxiety with minimal side effects. The only, the only side effects were, were um, some mild GI upset. So really using all the tools you have, recognizing that not one person and not one modality has all the answers, um, doing as much as you can to get your patients as far as you can, and then really looking even more outside the box than our functional medicine practitioners already are to help our kids you know, and, all the, and patients, adult patients, in all the ways possible. I was going to say that's a wonderful uh, lecture and talk for this organization because they're, they're definitely um, uh, physicians who are looking for you know, root cause and, and uh, alternative methods you know, yeah. rather than just a, a pharmaceutical-based approach. Well, wh when did you get introduced to AFRN? So I actually, initially, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but I was initially trained with um, the IFM, mm -hmm. right, the Institute right. for Functional Medicine, sure. um, back in two, was it maybe 1999 or 2000? 
that um, I was one of the first pediatricians to really go through their training. Um, there still is not a lot of pediatric functional medicine training, and that's one of my missions is to teach practitioners uh, functional medicine and integrative pediatrics and get comfortable seeing children in this way. Um, and so I had actually never really looked at AFRM too much because there wasn't a lot of pediatric focus. Um, my sister, who's an OBGYN, actually did the entire A4M certification and she has a, a great integrative practice in New Jersey. And so I was fascinated looking at um, the hormone module. I think A4M does a fantastic job with hormones and um, that is an area that I felt like I was lacking. So I've always kind of looked to see, well, when can I make it to an A4M hormone conference? Um, the immune module that I just taught for great, you know, great modules there. Um, but it was really this time where Sahar, you know, Sweden sure. had uh, had contacted me because she knew my sister mm -hmm. <laughs> and okay. had heard me speak in different venues yeah. um, and said, "Look, we're doing an autoimmune." module and pans and pandas so many adults probably have unrecognized pans and pandas um, or similar autoimmune infection driven neuropsychiatric disorders uh, so would you come talk and i was honored to so glad that we could you know share this pediatric knowledge because there's so much applicable to adults and then vice versa there's so much that AFRM and adult practitioners are doing that really should be applied to kids. So it's really kind of broadening our circle and seeing how we can all help each other and learn from each other. Well, we're thrilled you're here and thank you for also taking the time to join us on Redefining Medicine. Oh, you're welcome. I'm glad to be here.